How is it that after 10 years of live action princess remakes, only two princesses have good costume design? Cinderella, who I've already talked about extensively, and Aurora, who no one ever seems to talk about. And I don't think people realize just how lucky we were with her. The dresses for Belle, Ariel, Jasmine, and even the one dress I've seen for Snow White are underwhelming in comparison. Belle's dress had to be CGI'd, Ariel wore the same dress for three days straight, and Jasmine looks like less of a princess than Kim and Chloe did at the Ambani wedding. Aurora's dresses may not be grand, luxurious ball gowns, but their beauty is in their simplicity. They're both respectful of the original animation and reimagined. These are high quality, intricate gowns that feel fairy tale. This magical craftsmanship is what so many of these other dresses lack. So let's finally give Aurora some respect because I really need Disney to wake up and make good dresses again. Animated Aurora comes to life in two adaptations, Maleficent and Maleficent Mistress of Evil. How much her costumes reference the animation was approached differently by the costume designers of each movie. The Maleficent movie's costumes were designed by Anna B. Shepard, and Mistress of Evil was designed by Ellen Mirajnik. In Maleficent, Shepard chose to avoid the animated image of Aurora. The animated version was designed by Mark Davis, who also helped design Cinderella, Alice, and Bambi, among many other iconic characters. Sleeping Beauty's design is mature with full curves and a seductive neckline, but Aurora is only 15 going on 16 in the movie. I really love Aurora's design. I always thought she was so beautiful and I love all of her dresses, but I can also agree that this does not look like a 15 year old. So in Maleficent, Shepard chose to clothe Aurora modestly to better reflect her age. Plus, Elle Fanning was just 14 years old at the time of filming. Shepard gave Aurora, quote, very long, very fluid, and not sexy at all silhouettes to emphasize her girlishness. Aurora's off-the-shoulder necklines don't appear in the first movie. Instead, the dresses have a conservative underlayer with extra long sleeves. Wanting to portray a realistic live-action teenager in place of the unrealistic animation is a great reason to change an iconic outfit. This makes sense. Where this doesn't make sense is in Aladdin. Jasmine's outfits in that movie are also more modest. She doesn't have off-the-shoulder sleeves and her midriff doesn't show, but Jasmine is aged up in the live action. She's only 15 in the animation, and while her age isn't officially listed in the live action, Naomi Scott was 26 at the time of filming, so Jasmine was likely supposed to be in her early teens or late 20s. That's not to say she needs tiny tops and super low-rise pants. There is also the argument that Jasmine is too sexy in the animation, but I always loved how her outfits never detracted from her bold, independent assertiveness. It's the turquoise outfit that is supposed to reference her iconic animated outfit that gets me the most. Why have a faux nude lining if her stomach is going to show anyway when she dances? I do like the silhouette of the pants and the peacock design on the veil though. The one time Aurora does reference the animation in Maleficent is when she wears blue at the time she pricks her finger and falls asleep. In the animation, Aurora also does this in her blue version of her gown. In Mistress of Evil, Mirajnik references the animation more often. In fact, Elle Fanning specifically asked to have Aurora's iconic dress during their first meeting. The first reference to the animation is Aurora's dress during the family dinner scene, which includes a soft pink hue and pointed collar. This is a variation of her court dress in the animated version. I originally didn't like this dress because I thought it looks like a nightgown, but then I realized that this is Sleeping Beauty, so actually it works perfectly. Her final dress though is a direct homage to the animation. I love this dress. It's such a shame that it barely gets any screen time. This is a perfect recreation of an iconic dress that also fits well with the new story that they're telling. It still has that iconic off-the-shoulder neckline, A-line frame, and pointed bodice, but there are also these long tulle bell sleeves that you can't really see in the movie. It also isn't a deep pink. It's more of a soft, dusty rose. 
but I much prefer that because I think if it was too vibrant, it might look a bit costumey. It's also nice that this dress is pink because her wedding dress turns blue and Aurora is known for both colors. It makes sense to reference these sexier outfits now since Mistress of Evil takes place five years later than Maleficent. Aurora is around 21 in this movie. At the same time though, both of these dresses still follow her down-to-earthness established in the first movie. There is one misstep for the animated references though, which is no reference to Aurora's woodland dress. This is one of my favorite peasant Disney princess dresses, especially with her little shawl and her little basket. I understand not wanting to reference the darker color palette and I'm gonna touch on that a little bit later, but the silhouette is so perfect to reinterpret while Aurora grows up in the first movie. That said, I'm so happy that we at least get great references to her most iconic dress. Unlike Belle's, which is not only not gold, but also lacks gloves, or even Ariel, who didn't even get a sparkle dress or an oversized hair bow. Since the films are set in the 14th century, both Shepard and Mirajnik referenced late medieval and renaissance fashion in their designs. In Maleficent, this meant Aurora's dresses were made of cotton, thin wools, and hand-woven embroidery. In both movies, her silhouettes have long bell sleeves, empire waistlines, and low-rise belts that loosely match the fashion of that time. Also side note, but I love the renaissance outfits of the king and queen during this christening. Since this is a fantasy and not a period piece, the fashion doesn't have to be historically accurate. In fact, I prefer when fantasies have costumes that are a little more magical. That said, if it's set in the human world in a specific country and era, the pieces should look believable to that country and era. It doesn't necessarily have to be accurate, but just believable. This is why Belle's dress doesn't work. Her dress doesn't look like a believable 1700s French ball gown, even when the rest of the sets and costumes try to reference that era. And most notably, this dress has no corset, which Emma Watson didn't want because she thought that Belle wouldn't want one because corsets would restrict her. But corsets weren't torture devices. They were quite fashionable pieces for the time and they helped streamline the shapes of dresses. I think though, had the rest of this dress looked better, I probably could have accepted no corset, but because it doesn't, no corset is just another misstep that makes the entire dress worse. Because this dress looks more like a prom dress than a French ball gown, most people will probably unconsciously perceive this dress as lazy, which should not be associated with any princess. On the topic of fantasy and quality, Aurora's dresses feel distinctly fairy tale. This is important because the story is an adaptation of a fairy tale. It's a mix of Charles Perrault's 1528 The Sleeping Beauty in the Woods and the brother Grimm's 1812 version Little Briar Rose. Aurora's costumes truly look like they were woven by fairies. At first, as she grows up, her dresses are made by the three good fairies who perhaps aren't used to making human dresses, so the fashion is simpler. But then she's gifted an all gold dress when she's crowned queen of the Moors. It has a detailed embroidery and a fabric texture that looks like gold leaf, plus a golden wreath tiara. So it is possible to make a golden dress Belle. With the medieval empire waistline silhouette, this is a perfect blend of human and fairy, which is fitting because Aurora is a human and becoming queen of a fairy world, uniting the races together. It's also her most detailed outfit in the first movie, so this evolution is so impactful. This definitely feels like a princess-worthy dress. But her most magical dresses are in Mistress of Evil. All her moor dresses intentionally look fairy made. They're whimsical, so intricate and surreal. For her first dress, Mirajnik believed it was important to introduce her in something ethereal because of the land she now rules. She mentions that the fabric was quote, like individual leaves as only the fairies could create. It was all this hand woven lace. And there are these gossamer underlayers that are all different colors. So the colors shift in the lights from pink to blue to lilac. It really reminds me of Cinderella's iridescent underlayers. 
This dress is organic and natural, but still queen-like and regal. There's also a really beautiful dress with hundreds of lace flowers and appliques, but you can barely see it in the movie because she's backlit. It's just as beautiful. Aurora even exclaims that fairies made it, and it definitely looks like they did. There's such an ethereal quality about these dresses, and I can physically see the craftsmanship and quality that went into making them. Jasmine's or Belle's dresses, in even what I've seen of Snow White's, they look more like theater costumes. Actually, no, more like park costumes, because have you seen Jasmine's outfits on Broadway? They are so much better. Even Belle's from the musical look more French and ball gown. I know a lot of craftsmanship went into these costumes as well, but this cartoonish style holds them back so much. Their dresses aren't technically made by fairies, but they're still fantasy, and Belle's dress is made from some magic. There's a a distinct difference between making believable fantasy dresses and making caricature costumes. I want whimsical fantasy, not artificial fantasy. And I especially don't want CGI'd ball gowns. The dress Emma Watson wore for filming was shorter and had a less full skirt so that she could dance easier. Then they CGI'd this in post because it didn't look grand enough in the final product. I don't know how no one caught this design flaw before filming. And I also talked about this in my Cinderella video. And actually, Cinderella is the only other princess that has quality fairy tale dresses. And honestly, she does it better, I'm not gonna lie. I've already gushed about this dress and all the other costume designs in my Cinderella video because I think Cinderella's costume design has the best live action princess fashion. I mean, I love Aurora's, but Cinderella's is mind blowing. We can go watch that video if you want to hear more about it. Perhaps the biggest difference between this Aurora and the other live action princesses is that Aurora's story is an adaptation of Sleeping Beauty, not a remake. These movies, they're really about Maleficent, though Aurora is still a centerpiece to the story. Since the Maleficent movies are adaptations, they add new elements to the animated story. Sleeping Beauty, for example, she only gets just under 18 minutes of screen time in a one hour and 15 minute animated movie. She doesn't even speak after waking up or even the entire second half of the movie. In the live actions, Aurora has an active role and the costume designers took advantage of that. For one, Aurora gets multiple dresses. The only other princess exception would be Jasmine. She does get quite a few costumes changes. But tell me why you had the opportunity to make oceanic, seashell, beachy princess dresses and you gave us one over three days. And this pink dress is seen for like 30 seconds, so it hardly counts. And you definitely don't take away a dress like Ariel's sparkly reunion one. I don't necessarily mind Ariel's dresses. I know some people really don't like them. I'm actually okay with the way that they look. I just don't like how we get so little of them. And the way she reunites with Eric is so depressing. Belle does have a couple peasant dresses, but they're really different layers of the same dress. Since Aurora has multiple dresses, they help add to the new story and her reimagined character. Even if the other princesses get a couple more dresses, they don't really expand on the storytelling in the same way. For example, Aurora's dresses are all based in nature. She has a minimal makeup, flowers in her hair, and flower designs on almost every gown, from her belts to appliques to embroidery. She was even supposed to have handmade flower crowns, but they were deemed too much for her character. Even still, this version of Aurora is visually down to earth, delicate and feminine. Elle is very natural and Aurora grows up in the woods, so a floral aesthetic makes so much sense. And flowers are also nature's natural beauty. Her dresses are also lightweight and flowy so that she can move through the forest with ease. She never wears heels, only handmade lace-up booties and sometimes bare feet. Even though the animated version grows up in the woods as well, this outfit doesn't necessarily sell that as much as the live actions do. In the first movie, the only problem I have with these dresses 
is that they look a little too clean for a girl who lives in the woods and is supposed to be a peasant girl. I think the good fairy outfits look a little bit better in this regard. They look more lived in and authentic. Aurora's color palette is also changed from the animation. In the live action, her colors are lighter with pastels favored over darker hues and vibrancy. Shepard wanted to give Aurora, quote, the same light like Elle has in real life. So she created costumes that matched Elle's personality and her fair complexion. She wears pale yellows, pinks, and blues. Pastels are also often associated with innocence, youth, and playfulness. And as we've established, this Aurora is much more innocent, so lighter colors help convey that better. As she grows up with the eccentric fairies, she's mostly in yellows and oranges. These are energizing colors, which the energetic fairies probably picked out for her. She only starts to wear her iconic blues and pinks when she meets Maleficent and starts to come into her own. She does wear blue when Maleficent saves her as a child, but this was likely to help her stand out in the yellow grass. This lightness also contrasts Maleficent, whose heart is darkened by humans and is a villain for much of the story. Contrasting the sexier and cruel outfits of Maleficent is another reason why Aurora has simple outfits. Shepard said, quote, I wanted to stay away from something that is too modern and too sexy. I didn't want to create the impression that she's dressed up, which Maleficent arguably is once she crowns herself as queen. They do share one visual similarity though. In the first movie, Aurora's cloak, when they first meet, resembles a simpler version of the cloak Maleficent wears when her wings are ripped away. The idea was that Maleficent would be reminded of her younger self when she was as innocent as Aurora, and this resemblance would help her decide to take her in. In Mistress of Evil, their starkest contrast is in the dinner scene, when Maleficent meets Philip's parents. Aurora is in a sweet pink flowery gown that is free and simple. Maleficent is in a dress made with bones, which is harsh and intimidating. Maleficent still distrusts humans, while Aurora is about to marry one. It's a visual representation of the distance that's growing between them. Aurora is then taken in by Ingrith and experiences human royal life, and her dresses start to change to match this. This is actually why the collar of her dinner dress finally matches the court dress of the animated version, because she's visiting a castle instead of living in the woods. I do like the gold detailing that is in the concept art of this pink dress better, but it does make sense to cut that out so that her simplicity contrasts Queen Ingrith. Ingrith's opulence. The more she stays with Ingrith, her dresses become more unnatural and constricted. The fabrics become stiffer, the colors become darker, and the necklines higher. Her hair is tightly wound and no longer flowing and free. She starts to wear the gold and pearls that are iconic to Ingrith. There is no simplicity or whimsy. This contrast highlights the discomfort she feels in this life, Ingrith's influence, and emphasizes the difference between magic-made garments and man-made ones. Much of this movie is about the destruction of nature by humans, and in this case, Ingrith. But for the final act of Mistress of Evil, Aurora's outfits show her growth. She wears a basic shift or undergarment, which looks like a nightdress during the battle scene. At first, very similar to the first pink dress, I didn't like this choice because I thought it was really boring. But this simplicity and shedding all those outer layers represents her starting to come back to her simple roots. Her hair is down, there's no excess of details or jewels. This is right before she was going to put on her wedding dress and she was going to put on Ingrith's dress. So not doing that symbolizes her not choosing that life. Plus she's also Sleeping Beauty. So a night dress during a battle is kind of iconic. In the end, this dress is transformed into her wedding gown. The wedding dress is a representation of Aurora's full return to nature. I do not think that this dress gets enough recognition. There are six different colors and layers of chiffon and hundreds of handcrafted flowers, all to represent a wild flower field. Specifically, the train is so beautiful. On this dress, there's actually no jewels no beating, everything is very soft and delicate. And of course, as an homage to the animation, the dress shifts in color until it settles on her iconic blue. The one thing that I don't love about this dress, and this is very similar to what I said in my Cinderella video, but when they changed the color of it to blue, they made everything blue which I think takes away from the detail and dimension of the original dress. Because in the original version, the dress is sort of a white color and then the flowers are pink and they stand out against the white. But in the blue version, everything is 
a very similar shade of blue, so you lose that dimension. And can I just say that Prince Philip's wedding outfit is so underwhelming. I really wish I had recorded myself watching this movie because I was so annoyed at Philip. He does nothing in this movie. He didn't even stand up to his own mom in the end. The animated Philip was out here fighting dragons, singing and waltzing. I like my Disney princes to have dimension. Aurora can do better. Hi, this is me from editing. So I realized that Philip does actually stand up to his mom. There's like a whole one minute scene of him doing this, but you know what? It's still not enough. I still think he's kind of boring. Her wedding dress though is so much better than Belle's. And even though I don't not like this dress, I think this dress is actually really beautiful. I just don't think it makes sense for Belle. For example, the flowers I feel like should be roses at least, but maybe this is a certain French flower, I'm not sure. But jasmines, I mean, okay, this is so much better in the Broadway play. I mean, look at this. This is so beautiful. I love the purple, the little tassels. I don't know how we went from this beautiful purple gown in the animation to this pretty great rendition in the play to this. I don't even, I don't know. I don't know what this is and it just makes me so sad. But I actually really want to know what you think because I know a lot of people really love Jasmine's dresses. And I don't know what people really think of Belle's wedding dress. Or do you even like Aurora's dress? Because I will fight you if you don't. I'm just kidding. Aside from Aurora's dresses and Maleficent and Ingrith, which I think also have really good costume design, but don't you think that the surrounding costume and set design in the second movie declined so much? I'll give you an example. Look at how sad this king's outfit looks versus the king in the first movie. It looks so weathered and worn and truly authentic. And then there's King Stefan, who looks immensely regal in this robe and all his furs. But this other king in the second movie feels so cheap in comparison. The first movie looks so cinematic. Like, look at these shots of King Stefan as he descends into madness. This shot of Aurora's bedroom, which again, I think this room looks a lot better than the room in the second movie. Plus all these ominous shots of Maleficent. The second movie is so bright and less intense. It's missing that cinematic flair. It's also strange because both movies had roughly the same budget. I really think something happened in 2017 or something where they decided to deprioritize a cinematic look and instead go for something more cartoonish. Perhaps they wanted a standardized style for all these movies because Cinderella and The Jungle Book and Alice in Wonderland and Maleficent, they all look very different. And then if you compare the later movies, they all look very similar. But I just think that this style looks so much cheaper. I don't know, that's just me. I'd love to know what you guys think. Maybe I'm just crazy. I also might be bitter because I just don't really like remakes in general, but I do admire Maleficent's movies because they are different stories. I think this is pretty deserving to have been made as a movie, but if you are going to do remakes and do them in live action, the most exciting thing you can do, especially for princess movies, is to make realistic, magical princess dresses and bring childhood dreams to life. I would be so excited to do that if I were making one of these movies. I think Aurora's dresses do that so well, and it's a shame people don't talk about them as much because maybe if there was more of an uproar about it, Disney would make dresses like this again, but who am I kidding? Probably not. Let me know what your favorite live action princess dress is. Even if it's one that I don't like, I love hearing different opinions. Have a good night, guys. Get your beauty sleep, and thank you so much for watching.